I am an engineer who leads the labs team at a company called Mapbox. And I want to talk to you today about some of the challenges and exciting things we get to work with uh, when we think about visualizing spatial data on our platform. Um, so first of all, Mapbox has gotten a lot of love here at PlotCon. Uh, We've heard the name come up. It's really great to meet users and developers who are integrating our tools into their platforms. Uh, but for those of you who don't know, um, Mapbox is a company that builds APIs and SDKs that help you make awesome maps. Um, so this seems pretty straightforward, but I'd like to break down the three, three pieces of this. So first of all, what, are, what do we mean by APIs and SDKs? Uh, who are you? Uh, and what do we mean when we say maps? It seems pretty straightforward, but... Uh, there, we, we like to think about that differently. So first of all, you are um, users and developers of data visualization and business intelligence uh, software. Uh, so we power the maps in Tableau, we power the maps in IBM Cognos, we power the maps in Plotly, we power the maps of MapD and Uber's DeckGL, which we heard about earlier. Uh, we, we, we may not be the name you see up front on all of these platforms, but uh, we provide the technology that lets them uh, work with spatial data. What do we mean by a map? Uh, you probably have a picture in your head that looks something like this. Uh, seems pretty straightforward. You've got some geographic data. You've got some man-made features around there. Uh, you've got names and labels, cities, streets. You might even have some data visualized on top of that, like here we just have a point showing where we are right now. You also have things like addresses uh, and directions. Uh, so when you start breaking down these pieces, you can, you can kind of understand uh, the, the components a little better. Uh, at Mapbox, we break these down even further. So when we deliver a product to our users, it's not a single completed map. Uh, it's really a set of APIs and SDKs, which we think of as the building blocks or the, the Lego bricks, if you will, uh, that you can assemble and customize and put together in whatever way you like to make the mapping experience or spatial data experience that best fits your data, your application, and your users. So some of the building blocks we provide are things like tools for styling and designing maps, uh, APIs for getting directions, routing you from point A to point B, anywhere in, and anywhere in between, uh, a traffic layer that has up to the minute uh, delays and traffic jams, information so that our directions can come, become smarter, geocoding APIs that'll turn a latitude and longitude into an address or a business or a point of interest and vice versa. Satellite imagery layers, which give you a great composite view from some of the best satellite providers out there. Spatial analysis tools uh, in a platform we call TurfJS, which lets you do uh, things like measure distances, geographic distances between points, uh, find features that overlap or intersect with each other. Uh, all, all your standard spatial uh, operations, uh, we have that provided in a JavaScript library where you can do that on the browser or on a Node.js server. We also have a really great OpenGL rendering system, WebGL on the web, uh, and SDK for, SDKs for iOS, Android, uh, as well as Unity. Uh, and this is what lets you pull map data into your application and visualize it right away. And a whole bunch of other little things. Uh, but where do I come into this and my team? Uh, Mapbox Labs, uh, Peter's here in the audience, uh, works with me on labs. Um, we, uh, turns out people, don't always understand what they can do with a set of loose building blocks. So w our team is charged with using all of the blocks that our, team, uh, that our company uh, produces and putting to them together in ways that inspire and uh, inform our, our users of, of what's possible. So it's a really great job. We get to play around with all aspects of the company, try things until they break, think about new ideas and new combinations of tools and things. Uh, how did I get into this? Uh, I, I think it goes way back to this book I had as a kid, um, put out by the Klutz Publishing Company uh, called Earth Search. It had this amazing aluminum cover, uh, uh, cover made from an old aluminum can, and uh, this view of the South Pole with uh, Antarctica, and you kind of had to decide right away on the cover which way to spin it. Um, and it's, as it says, it's just a kid's geography museum in a book. Uh, and I think everything I know about maps today still comes from here at some point. Uh, it's a really engaging book for a 10-year-old to play with, but also full of really key information for understanding how data and, and, and working with spatial data can, 
can really help you understand and, and affect the world. Uh, this is kind of a classic example that comes up from time and time again. John Snow in the 1850s in London uh, trying to find the source and the transmission vector of a uh, cholera outbreak. And he did this by charting each point uh, of, uh, which is kind of morbid, all of these are points representing somebody's death from cholera in this neighborhood and kind of triangulating and finding the hot spots and basically locating one water source, this Broad Street pump, as, as the, the source of, of, of the outbreak and identifying that probably uh, this disease was transmitted by water and, and germs. Um, so this, uh, this story comes up again and again as we talk about the history of, of data visualization, and it's right here, 10-year-old uh, me learning about how, how inspiring this can be. Um, there's also these really playful activities in here uh, that help you think about what, what a map is. Um, I bought this copy on eBay because I didn't have mine from my childhood, and somebody had already punched this out. But this used to be a uh, map of the world split into this weird shape uh, that you could then punch out and glue onto a tennis ball and then make your own globe. And the idea here is you're playing with how, how difficult is it to turn something like the reality of the world and, and put it on a flat map. Uh, if that doesn't do it for you, this is my favorite. It's Arnold Schwarzenegger's head, a round thing. Uh, and a picture of a globe. And if you were to try and distort Arnold's head in the same way that you do the Mercator projection, uh, it would look like this. Uh, so we think of this picture of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a map on a piece of paper on a screen as somehow being honest and real. Um, when you do it to a human face, you see it's, it's not quite the case. Uh, so, so I bring up these two things because I think everything we do at Mapbox comes down to this, that, that maps are really hard and, and maps are also great. Um, maps are hard because whenever you try and turn the complexity that's our reality into a really simplified picture on a page or a screen, something is, is necessarily lost and you have to make really tough decisions about how to, how to focus in on the kinds of data you want to show. But maps are also great um, at being at a kind of data viz conference, you'll, this will resonate with you. They're great because they, they function both as this container and a canvas for visualizing data. Well, they're, at the same time, they're also the visualization of spatial data themselves, the underlying polygons and points and lines and things that, that form up the base map. And when, when done well, these two types of information can reinforce each other, and they provide local context and a sense of uh, orientation that you don't necessarily get with other visual forms. And this is why we, we go on, even though uh, sometimes it's, it's challenging. Um, so yeah, so Mapbox works to make some of the, the hard parts of working with geodata or spatial data easier so that you can focus on communicating the message that you want your data to, 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 to have. So what's this look like? Um, this, is a, this is an older demo done by somebody who's been at Mapbox a long time, Eric Fisher. Um, I gotta start it. And what he did is he took billions and billions of, 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 Twitter, uh, of tweets that had geodata associated with them and he plotted them on this, on this map and tried to categorize them with the two colors you see here um, based on whether that user uh, had historically tweeted a lot in that location or was relatively new to that, that kind of neighborhood or the city. Uh, and then categorize those two as locals or tourists. Um, so from that one, that one dimension of the data, you, you, get, you get this coloration out of here. But, uh, which, which is really great because you start to see these patterns and you can immediately understand that there's some significance and, and local meaning to, to the underlying data points there. Um, you see areas like uh, Times Square, uh, yeah, Times Square in, in New York City lighting up in red, very popular with tourists. Uh, you go over to JFK Airport, um, also obviously popular with tourists or visitors. Uh, and then the background is kind of formed by all of these blue points of, of other, of other um, locals just going about their daily business. Um, so kind of like Jon Snow's cholera outbreak map in that it's, it's points on a map, uh, but, but you look a little closer and you see this other thing is that there is no map here. There's no underlying base map that you're looking at. Uh, what you see is, is something that looks like the city and streets and things that you're familiar with because that's, that's where people are. Um, so the, the, the map is formed entirely by the data set here and, and there is no separation. Um, now there's a ton of data points there and we, we can back up and think about like, well, well how, do you, how do you create 
uh, create that kind of visualization. And Eric found that the, the tools weren't really out there to do what he wanted in a way that would then make this shareable and uh, able to be put on a web page so that anybody could, could check this out. Um, so he kind of built his own tool chain from, from scratch with this. And it led up to a tool called Tippy Canoe, uh, which turns uh, these massive data sets of, of point data uh, or other kinds of data as well into vector tile sets, which is our transmission format for uh, saving and storing and um, transmitting uh, map data across, across the web to millions of users at scale. Um, and it, I, this is kind of boring to show you a picture of a GitHub repo, but, but the idea I want to get across here is that uh, you know, all, of, all of this stuff is released as open source tools. So these, these are things that you can go and recombine in, in your own ways as well. And if you look at the Mapbox organization on GitHub itself, uh, we have over 625, at last count, uh, public repos that you can go ahead and uh, use and contribute to, uh, make pull requests, understand the, the discussions behind why we make decisions the way we do. Uh, we do this for a huge part of our data processing pipeline. Our, all of our rendering tools, our WebGL-based render, as well as our iOS SDKs and all that, are um, also completely public, open GitHub repo projects. Um, so you can, you can check out uh, how, that's, how that's going on and, and use this stuff um, and, and, and contribute to it. Um, and we do that because that's really at, at the root of, of who we are as a company. There is no Mapbox uh, without this project called OpenStreetMap. And for those who aren't familiar with OpenStreetMap, you can think of it kind of like the uh, Wikipedia of mapping data. So starting with some very, uh, with, with public data sources that might be put out by the city or the local government uh, about streets and building locations, um, which are oftentimes very incomplete and not, and not accurate and don't provide a, a full picture of the neighborhood, uh, individual users then can go on here and update and add and edit the data of their local neighborhood or anywhere around the world. And so we could go in here and we can look at the, the building we're in right now, the Scottish Rite Center. It actually has a ton of great data right now. But if it didn't, we could add the, the, the name of it, the number of floors it has, the height of the building, any, anything about that. Correct the building outline so that it, it coincided with a new addition. Um, and this is happening all over, all over the world all the time. And this is, this is our primary data source that we use to make our base maps. Uh, and, and this is only really possible in, in the recent decade. Uh, if you look at the growth of OpenStreetMaps over the past 10 years, uh, this is a little out of date, but you'll see there's just this explosion of growth of a project that started in uh, North America, really the United States and Western Europe, has now grown to have global coverage. So we have, we have access to mapping data that is, uh, is very complete in Southeast Asia, in Latin America, in Africa, all, all these corners of the world that are uh, really driven by community efforts and, and crowdsourced efforts to make a better map. Now, we also have really demanding clients on our side who uh, will point out errors in, in the mapping data they, they get and, and ask us to fix that. And we have a really great data team that works around the clock to, uh, to improve the map consistently. And what I really love is that we don't just take those improvements or those edits and feed them back into our proprietary data set, but we make those changes on the OpenStreetMap base map itself. And then our data pipeline processes the same information that, that anybody else has access to um, and turns that into the product that we, we, um, we serve to our millions of users. So we are committed to working with this community and helping them build their capacity uh, and helping everybody have access to better data for the, this, this living base map of the world. Okay, so I keep saying, I keep saying base map, base map, base map, and uh, talking about data visualization to some extent. So anybody who's worked with uh, uh, visualizing data on uh, a map, uh, it's probably familiar with some concept, whether it's explicit or not, where you think about, you have your base map, which is, which is the underlying geographic forms that you're working with, and then you have a data overlay. You have some information that you're, you're laying on top. Now with our most recent uh, generation of tools, this line between base map and data overlay has really begun to blur. And we really think of the map as data, and your data becomes part of the map. Um, this is a, a demo I've, I've done that, that I think is, is a decent example of this, uh, which is, it's a visualization of shipping traffic data in the San Francisco Bay. So this is pulled from a data set published by the US Coast Guard. All of the big ships out in the Bay are constantly broadcasting over uh, radio frequency, their current position. Coast Guard listens for those signals and uh, uh, archives this and then, and then 
uh, anonymizes it and publishes it to, to the public. So I downloaded this data set in a, you know, it's not really a useful format, it's a really long string of numbers, and turned it into something that could be visualized on our tools, um, and then styled it so that the, 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 uh, the surrounding area provides context. The outline of San Francisco and Oakland and Marin County um, are familiar shapes for anyone who's in this, who's, who's seen a, a picture of this, this area. Um, but they're really de-emphasized in favor of bringing forward this data set uh, that is showing the activity on the water. Um, and so you, you, you can see these really interesting patterns and contexts. Like out here you're seeing the traffic lanes uh, of shipping lanes. So those are just suggestions on the nautical charts on the map, but the data of where those, those uh, ships have actually moved uh, confirms that, that they they align pretty pretty closely in those lanes for safety reasons. Um, you can see the, the patterns of, of, of density and uh, where the interesting spots are. You'll see along the, the waterfront, the Embarcadero, that really bright spot, bright spot in the middle, and out to Alcatraz Island, there's a lot of tourist boats that'll, that'll loop around there. Um, and so these are things that, that add to our understanding of, of this area we live in. Uh, and, and they're done. They're done in a in a, in a visual way. You know, I, I can narrate this, but but a lot of this, hopefully, you can see just just at a glance of this picture. There's also uh, it's just fun to have my own little ant farm where where all of the boats march around. Um, so so the, bringing this to life and making it an interactive, dynamic experience is something that that's possible uh, on our platform, and it's it's been really great to to build out this kind of work. Um, so kind of quickly here, I'll, I'll show you like how, how do we actually do that with Mapbox tools? Uh, what you're looking at doesn't look all that different, uh, primarily because this is this is our map design tool uh, called Mapbox Studio, where we can actually make all of those changes uh, visually and and edit the the styling of the of the map and the data at the same time. So oh, this isn't playing. Um, so it, as I as I go through this editing process in Studio, I can kind of switch to this X-ray mode view. Um, where you'll see the underlying vector data that 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 I can that I can style and change on the fly. So this is this is not a picture or a rasterized version of this data. It's it's the data itself, and uh, I can set all of the aspects of the visual display of this in the layout. Um, so I can click in on the the label of San Francisco, for example. I've taken off all the streets already because that's not relevant to what I want to show here. Um, and I could go in here and adjust the size and color and opacity of of every single element. Uh, we also have have cool tools for doing what we call data driven styling. Um, so if I have a data set, uh, there's one other dimension here that, that I, I didn't mention is the uh, bathymetry data or the depth data of the water in the bay. Uh, that's not part of our default Mapbox base map, but NOAA uh, publishes a, a data set of this that I, I, I could pull in. And uh, there's one parameter, there, there's some shapes of all of the different contours and there's one parameter describing their depth. And I can use that, that data parameter to drive a color ramp and style the, the display of, of, the, of the ocean um, accordingly. And so all of this happens in our map design tool and we also have programmatic access to it through our SDKs uh, so that you can change any of these components on the fly. Uh, one more demo I want to show here. This is, is something I'm working with the team on this week. Uh, and this is not your typical data visualization, but it's, it's a, a place where I, th I think the, the boundaries between data visualization and like an interactive application can start to, to break down. Um, so what you're looking at here is some scenario where, uh, let's imagine you, you have a, a trucking company that's picking up uh, packages around the city of San Francisco and returning them to uh, San Francisco airport so that they can be shipped to their destination uh, by airmail. And you're trying to figure out, okay, there's some packages right now, I'm gonna go out and pick them up and I might get additional orders throughout the day. Uh, I wanna understand, I wanna have a full truck and I wanna understand uh, how, how disruptive picking up an additional package is going to be to my, my trucker's route. So you might be sitting in your command center, you send your truck out, you're following it down the road as it's broadcasting its, its GPS location back to you. Uh, and as you can see, when we started this off, all of these little indicators for pickups were red, saying like they're all gonna take like 20 to 30 minutes. It's gonna take you a while to get there. Uh, as soon as we select one though, the ones in its immediate vicinity become much, much less costly to pick up and the ones further away still, still are more expensive. And so you, so you get this information at your fingertips. Um, it's not a static visualization. It's not, it's not a table of, of information. This is something a trucking company today might be doing uh, with like Excel spreadsheets, literally just, just trying to plot this out and copy and paste things. Uh, 
but uh, with, with, a, with a tool like this, we can both visualize and interact with it at the same time and, and get all of these kind of typical mapping features that, we, that, we, that we're familiar with, this kind of follow the car view, um, be able to pan and zoom smoothly, uh, and, and access to all of the, the styling and design tools that I was talking about earlier. Like the base map kind of fades away in, in the background here. It's very understated and we can focus on the information that we want to show. Um, this, is, this is using also uh, an API we released called the Optimized Trip API, which is kind of a traveling salesman problem solver. So we, we provide these, these additional functions on top of just uh, managing and displaying data to actually make decisions around the data source you're working with. And, and part of why we're, we're doing this and, and why I want to share this with you is because we've really found that the more data and feedback we have, the more usage of our maps we have, the better maps we can make, and, and then we can share those out with our users in turn. So when we send somebody out with a, a, a mobile device that's running our maps uh, and they're moving through the city, getting turn-by-turn -turn directions to their destination, or it's uh, helping them visualize their fitness, uh, their, fitness their workout routines, um, we uh, are receiving some anonymized, we take privacy very seriously, but we're receiving some anonymized telemetry feedback from that so we can see how people move throughout the city. And in turn, we get to see really interesting patterns, like, like where are really popular places, um, what does, how does this activity pattern change from, from day to day and week to week? Uh, and we, we, we do this at a really amazing scale. We process over, at this point, over 150 million miles of telemetry data per day. And that allows us to do things that uh, you, you can't possibly do with, with any other kind of data source. So let's say, for example, you want to make sure that all of your freeway interchanges are, are up to date and are providing you accurate routing directions. You want to know how many lanes are on that freeway. And you want to know which lane is, a, is an exit lane so you can guide somebody to, to the correct path. Um, well, you could do this in a number of ways, right? You could send, uh, you could go and look at this place in a satellite imagery. You can maybe do this with some machine learning and try and pull features out, but you're dealing with blurry images. You got clouds. Um, there's new construction all the time, and that doesn't coincide with your 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 frequency of, of satellite updates. Um, so, you know, that's that's very challenging. You could do this by sending somebody to drive along every piece of road in, in the regions you want to cover. That's very expensive. Uh, you could outfit their car with tons of sensors and, and try and understand that. Um, but really nothing beats the scale of having, all, of having millions and millions of sensors out there working to help, help uh, make this map better. So this is coming purely from telemetry data we come back. I don't know if any Mapbox employee or Mapbox owned piece of hardware has ever, ever driven on this segment of road. Um, but we get this really lane level detail of, of, of what's going on there. We can automate this process. Uh, we do things like finding missing streets. So if there's a, a region of very high activity and nobody, uh, and there's not a, a map in the open street map data set, uh, we will send somebody there to make sure, well, somebody will go and look in that part of the map to make sure that that is, is uh, accurate as it can be. Uh, and of course, we make those changes back to the public OSM map. Um, we also do this to, to power our traffic layers. And so how does that come back to you? We, we publish these SDKs, like this, this is really new, the Mapbox Navigation SDK, which allows you to do turn-by-turn -turn navigation inside of your app. So everyone's familiar with pulling up a local search app like, like uh, Yelp or Foursquare, and you find the thing you want, you click route, like get directions, and it'll pop you out to Google Maps or Apple Maps. Um, as an app developer, as a user, like this is really disruptive to your experience because suddenly you're using two maps when really you just want one stream of information. So part of our play here is like we want to give you the tools to to keep that all in your in in your app's experience. So when you hit get directions, you can not only keep them in your app, but add additional context and information and overlay things on on the route as they move throughout there. Um, and and the turn by turn directions. It's re this really great positive feedback loop because the more and more people that use this, the better it gets. So uh, 
yeah, so we have, we've, we're working on creating this, this living map that is in a lot of ways, I think, really one of the biggest data visualization projects in the world. It has, it has global coverage. We're taking in so much data every single day. And it really has this value because it's, it's, it's relatable. I hope no one is driving uh, back across the Bay Bridge into San Francisco right now. Uh, this is a few hours old, but um, you can see right now, like, like that, that's coming from, from uh, the map that we're building together. So uh, hopefully, if this sounds interesting to you, you would like to try out some of our tools. Um, it'll help us all make a better map, and I can't wait to see what you build. So thank you. Yeah, oh, questions. Regions the most uh, popular for um, well, what regions growing the most with data that you're collecting right now? Um, oh, that's a good question. I, I don't really know. <laughs> uh, we have uh, one of our, the most e exciting things that we've done recently is um, expanded to do maps in China, cool. um, which is is interesting because China actually outlaws OpenStreetMap. Uh, China has a monopoly and makes sure that all anybody who's publishing a map is officially licensed by the government. Mm -hmm. And we've partnered with a local company there to become officially, uh, officially authorized to publish maps in China. So that will allow us to reach a whole new audience. And um, yeah. Cool. Any other questions? Okay. We're all friends here, yeah. almost <laughs> literally. <laughs> Cool. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks.